Now, let's talk about the coming of the American Revolution. Even though Americans were feeling good and pride with Great Britain, the British were sensing contempt from the Americans in that they wanted more control of the colonies. This drive to gain new authorities over the colonies really began in 1763 and led directly to the American independence. Now, I want to have you focus a little bit on this slide, the first slide here, and see that there are certain significant events that will take place that are important during this particular section. The British Tea Act, the Boston Tea Party, and of course the work of uh, the First Continental Congress, the date for the independence, which we'll later talk about, and the different treaties, right? Now, let's go on and start talking about the colonies. Um, by the time of the American Revolution, many American colonies has generally came to believe that the creation of a republic would solve the problems of the monarchical rules because of a republic would establish a small, limited government responsible for the people. At the same year, George Grenville, an anti-American, became prime minister and he set out to solve some of the empire's most pressing problems. The main one was the debt from a previous and recent war. Prime Minister Grenville created a comprehensive program to deal with these problems and move all of his energy to put these policies into effect. He sent the Royal Navy to suppress American smuggling and enforce a Hasher Navigation Act. He imposed the Parliament Sugar Act, also known as the Revenue Act, aimed to raising revenue by tax on American imports. He was determined to maintain up to 10,000 British regulars to America to control both the colonies and Indians and have Americans pay for the maintenance of their stations. Americans had never been before required to support standing army before, so they were a little bit frustrated. In 1765, Granville passed the Stamped Act okay, of 1765. And you can see here in this slide, this is the actual um, insignia of that particular act, imposing a direct tax on Americans for the very, very first time. The Stamped Act required Americans to purchase revenue stamps on everything, from newspaper to important legal documents, etc. This dented and drained the currency of the colonies. Now, at first, the Americans reacted to this respectfully and stated that taxation without representation is tyranny. Resistance was, go was growing everywhere in the colonies, right? All over, and especially in Massachusetts, there was a revolt that was led by James Otis and Samuel Adams, who formed the organization known as the Sons of Liberty. This tactic worked so that other colonies copied to it, like Virginia denouncing the Stamp Act. Now, let's move on in October 1765 where delegates from the different colonies met as the Stamped Act Congress. They passed a moderate resolution against the act, specifically mentioning that Americans could not be taxed without their consent and that it was not fair that due to geographical location could not be represented in the parliament all the way back in London, England. The repeal of the Stamped Act spread throughout the colonies. Okay. And most effective in achieving the repeal is the actual boycott of British good. On a different issue, King George III replaced Prime Minister Grenville with Charles Lord Rockingham. In March 1766, under the new leadership, the Stamped Act was repealed. By then, something more robust came without notice, the Declaratory Act. This is an act claiming power to tax and make laws for Americans in all cases 
whatsoever. But the Americans ignored it because they thought, hey, guess what? Because they have repealed the Stamp Act, we're going to celebrate that. And they continued on their loyalty to Great Britain at this particular moment. Charles Townsend took over the short leadership of Charles Lord Rockingham. And Towson had blasted and could successfully tax the colonies. And in 1766, Parliament gave him his chance by passing this program taxes on items imported into the colonies. He was mistaken that the Americans could accept this. The Towson Act, as we called it, was also intended to use the court to try those accused of the violations. Now, the Americans did not really act or react at first. In February 1768, the Massachusetts legislature, at the leadership of Samuel Adams, okay, passed the Massachusetts circular letter calling the parliament to repeal the act. The British authorities acted on this. They ordered that if the letter was not withdrawn, the Massachusetts legislature should be dissolved. They also sent troops to Boston to handle the situation. The sending of troops along with the British authority repressive response to Massachusetts circular letter aroused the Americans to resistance. Merchants and authorities were having their own conflicted issues with each other and the new prime minister Frederick Lord North repealed all of the taxes except on tea, which proved to the Americans that Parliament still has the power. This led to what Samuel Adams would label as the Boston Massacre. Now, I want you to go back a little bit here, and this is the actual image and a flyer of the Boston Massacre, okay? Um, this is a very intense situation that was happening in Massachusetts back then. Now, going all the way over here, you could see that there are certain individuals that played a major role in trying to build the American colonies. Now, for the most part, most of these individuals, as you could see here in the screens, led this whole idea of having the war on independence, okay? Now, there was some chaos between Americans and British that started in Lexington, Concord, etc. okay? Now, for the most part, General Cage of Britain was forged and urged other British generals such as William Ho, Henry Clinton, and John Burgoyne. At this point, the American soldiers were increasing. This particular war and the frontier attack killed and wounded over 1,000 British soldiers. It was known to be the bloodiest of the war or that particular date, June 17, 1775. Now, let's go back to this image. May of 1775, the Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia. They spoke about the difficult situation that the facing, uh, facing the different colonies. They called for George Washington okay, uh, to command and adopt the declaration of the causes and necessity for taking up arms. In other words, to lead the Continental Army. And adopted, for the most part, the Oliver Branch petition, pleading that the King of England, King George III, to intercede with the Parliament to restore peace. Now, Britain, for the most part, ignored this. So the king declared the colonies in rebellion and no longer under his protection. Then, preparations were made for a full-scale war against America. It was the Prohibition Act that would state the official declaration of war against America. In America, on June 7, 1776, Richard Henry Lee okay, of Virginia introduced a series of different kind of policies, but mostly formal resolution in Congress calling for independence and a national government. 
Congress accepted these ideas and named two committees. John Dickinson worked out the framework for a national government and the other was to draft a statement which was called the Declaration of Independence, drafted by Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. Now, this image is that particular event. They were drafting the Declaration of Independence um, and for the most part, this was a restatement of ideas by then commonplace in America, showing why the former colonies felt justified in separating from the mother country, which was Great Britain. It was formally adopted by Congress on July 4th, 1776. Now, July 4th, 1776 should sound familiar to many of you if you know the basic of U.S. history, right? That is when we actually declared independence. Now, George Washington was the command of the war. Okay, he is the commander in chief. Although the British spent a lot of time building its army, at the times hiring people from Germany to join their troops, Washington was spending his time aggregating communities, forcing the British to move their troops out of Boston and even all the way out of Nova Scotia. Now, but the American armies were not prepared for the British force. They were actually undertrained, under-equipped, and badly outnumbered in many places. Now, they were defeated by the Battle of Long Island in August 27, 1776. Then the Battle of Washington Heights in August 29 to August 30th in Manhattan. With this, Washington strategized to move to New Jersey. Washington, with his small army melting away and demoralized, decided to go rogue on Christmas Eve, okay, 1776. His army crossed the Delaware River and struck opposition all the way to Trenton, New Jersey. It was a perfect timing because the opposition army were still very groggy from partying over Christmas Eve, and they were easily defeated later by Washington. Okay? And this happened actually around Princeton, New Jersey, on January 3rd, 1777. Because of this particular event, General Hode pulled his army from New Jersey. Then New Jersey was regained. Okay? But where did the American receive their arms a weapon? For the most part, we all know that this was uh, an act of France. France gave most of the Americans their weapons so that France can also have a say with their own special interests in how to, um, to beat or, uh, the whole British army. And so that at least if the Americans win, France can obviously influence the Americans to do other policies away from what the British want. And remember, from the previous lectures, we've already said that the British and France had their own tension uh, in, from the very beginning. Early in the war, France began making convert shipments of arms to the Americans. Not because France loved the notion of freedom, but it is because, for the most part, as I said, France hated Britain, and helping Americans was their way of weakening Britain's power for hoping that she would lose her colonies. Weapons and arms shipments were vital to the Americans at that time. In the summer of 1777, British had made some major plans to conquer some regions such as Albany area and General Howe moved to his troops at sea to all the way to Chesapeake Bay. Now, for the most part, in Philadelphia, Washington army at the same time were also still fighting but at first he was successful and then failed because of the thick fog and later gained training of his army. American victory in Saratoga in 1777 was the first major turning point of the war. Okay? And this was due to George Washington, the commander in chief of the army, ability to hold his forces together. In many ways, shape or form, 
George Washington ended up leading the Continental Army and winning the particular first step of the war to be able to really gain um, ownership and the new society here. And the American Revolution would be a war that would really produce a new society, a new sense of government, and a new start uh, for many of the colonies.